In Climate Watch, the pandemic has underscored the impact of human activity on the planet. And more specifically, just how big our carbon footprint really is. Here's CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Berardelli. Last week, our planet set yet another new record for carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas most responsible for heating our planet. The level reached 418 parts per million. That's 35 percent higher than in the 1800s. Well, sadly, every year it's a new milestone. That's Dr. Ralph Keeling, the son of Charles Keeling, the namesake of the famous Keeling curve. It vividly illustrates carbon dioxide concentrations catapulting during Keeling's 40-plus years sampling CO2 levels at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. He thought that there would be a consensus to do something about the problem about the point in the mid-90s when it was clear that temperatures were changing. Fifteen years after his father's death, Dr. Keeling is still carrying out the family's climate legacy. He's a geochemist at Scripps, the same place his dad worked. Keeling is also echoing his father's concerns about the planet's condition. It's been at least three million years and maybe a lot longer since the carbon dioxide levels were ever that high in the past. So we're moving into uncharted territory and, and, and worst of all, we're moving faster than ever. It's happening so quickly that Keeling is worried about the heavy burden his own children will have to bear. But I look at the generations ahead and I say, wow, there are going to be some real challenges out there. Challenges that relate to you know, populations moving and economic impacts of climate change, direct threats to human health and safety, catastrophic storms, fires. I mean, a lot of that's already touching us in some ways. As a result of the global quarantine, emissions are forecast to drop around 6 to 8 percent in 2020. But Leah Stokes, a professor at UC Santa Barbara, cautions that's just a drop in the bucket. I think we're all seeing the limits of, you know, staying home and not flying and maybe eating locally. Stokes says the public has been fooled by polluting industries, made to feel guilty about how our personal choices affect the environment. But this pandemic shows each one of us can only do so much. I believe it is government action that is very necessary. None of us can choose to unilaterally live in a low carbon society that isn't polluting. We're all locked into a system that has a lot of carbon pollution. More than 60 years after Charles Keeling laid the groundwork to tackle the climate challenge, we understand more clearly than ever that the road ahead will be tough. But Stokes affirms we now have the know-how, resources, and technology to solve it by directing our collective investments towards a clean economy. I would encourage people to remember the Moonshot Initiative, to remember World War II. The United States has taken on really big challenges in the past. And these are challenges we have overcome and become better by facing them head on. Jeff Berardelli, CBS News. And Jeff actually joins us now to go even deeper into a discussion about this important topic. So Jeff, put into perspective for us just how high are current CO2 levels? Yeah, you heard it in the story. It's at least been three million years. We know that from paleoclimatology, looking back at you know uh, records through the ages, uh, or maybe even longer than three million years that carbon dioxide has been this high. Um, and so, as you can see, we're in uncharted territory right now. We've gone up about 35% since the 1800s, and it's going up um, at around two to three parts per million uh, per year or so. So it's going up very fast, and humans have never lived in a situation where carbon dioxide levels were this high, and there's a little bit of a lag. So you, you raise carbon dioxide, temperatures begin to warm, and everything kind of, the system kind of catches up over the course of decades and centuries. And so whatever we've already emitted into the atmosphere is gonna be affecting us for hundreds of years to come. Now, Jeff, in your piece, you mentioned that emissions are forecasted to drop between 6 and 8% in 2020 due, due to these lockdowns. Um, Two questions. How significant of a drop is that? And uh, given that this is a one-time, hopefully, event and people are going to start coming back online and, uh, and our economy will get up and running again, that these gains, how much will these gains actually continue into future years? All right, so first of all, 6 to 8%. Well, first of all, it's a record. We've never dropped that much year to year. That's never happened before. But my first thought, and I think most climate scientists' first thought was, that's it? 
only six to eight percent, we basically locked ourselves in our, our homes all around the world. We've stopped driving around. Uh, industry, at least to some degree, has, has decreased. And we've only been able to manage six or eight percent, shave that much off of our emissions, not the concentrations, just the emissions. It's not very much uh, at all. And so it goes to show you how difficult a task this is going to be. No one is suggesting, no one wants to stop the economy every single year because we would need to do about six, seven, eight percent almost year over year for the next decade plus in order to bring emissions down uh, to net zero. Um, that's not going to be possible by shutting down our lives. And so it just kind of, for me, is a lesson on how much work we need to do to save ourselves uh, and, and save our ecosystem from climate change. What was your second question again? Well, one of the things that we've been talking about is the future of work. And, and as our viewers know, we think that, that more and more employers are going to allow people to work from home, as the, the Twitter CEO announced uh, just this week. If people continue to stay home more, if there's less commuting, uh, couldn't this pandemic and, and the lifestyle changes that came out of it actually have any lasting effect? Or once the economy reopens, we're back to our, admission, our emissions levels where they were before? So after 2008, we saw a very big spike. It went up even higher than it was before 2008. So we saw a little bit of a reprieve and then it bounced right back up past where it was before. Uh, this time is likely to be a little different because more people will be telecommuting. So it's certainly gonna help, but I think it's gonna be a drop in the bucket. I really do think it's, it's not going to be a, a very big amount, unfortunately. I wonder how much of that is just a gut punch uh, to people who have been working to try and decrease emissions, to try and uh, help safeguard our environment. And as you say, all of this, this shutdown only resulted in, um, in an 8% drop, and we're supposed to be dropping 8% every year for the next decade. Does that make you think that that, that goal isn't attainable? Well, it's very tough right now. Uh, certainly the United States government, but not just the U.S. government, many governments around the world are not moving fast enough. We're probably moving one of the most slowly uh, of all the countries uh, in the world. Um, but there are other countries that uh, also are, you know, kind of addicted to fossil fuels and, and it's been very hard for them to change their ways. I do have optimism and the reason why I have optimism is because the price of solar and the price of wind has gone down just unbelievably fast over the past 10 years. It's becoming a lot more economical than fossil fuels. It's also sun and the wind is, is not a commodity. You know, it, it's essentially God's creation. So, you know, no one controls it. So the point is it's always around. And so, you know, if we want energy independence and we don't want to fight with other nations for the control of these commodities, it, it's great for energy independence. And actually, you know, this is an interesting point is, you know, we're investing trillions of dollars trying to revive our economies, not only here in the United States, but all over the world right now. Trillions of dollars being poured into the economy. When you ask Americans, George Mason and Yale did a poll recently, asked Americans uh, if they think that money should be injected into saving or helping to save renewable energy, uh, about two thirds of people said yes. Then when you ask them the question, do you think that money should be given to fossil fuels? Uh, to help them out, or do you believe it should be given to renewable energy? 75% of Americans said renewable energy. Only 25% of Americans said fossil fuels. So it goes to show you that Americans understand that putting money in now into our future, and obviously renewable energy is in fact the future, putting money in now is going to help us to emerge better from this and kind of help us uh, build a very long-term foundation. So that's at least what Americans think, but uh, there hasn't been much progress lately uh, in Congress. Uh, in, in our government. Um, of course, that could change come November. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I was wondering uh, actually about that, Jeff. Uh, if 75% of Americans are saying, yes, we want the government to be investing more in, um, in clean energy and, and renewable energy, uh, are lawmakers right now doing anything to prioritize um, reducing carbon emissions? Well, certainly the Democrats are. There are some Republicans, not too many. It, you know, it's become more um, popular with Republican voters, especially young Republican voters. They definitely believe climate change is being caused by humans and they want to do something about it. It's extraordinarily popular with Democrats. Democrats definitely want to do something 
Um, obviously, you hear all about the Green New Deal. Um, it's not something that's being talked about seriously in Congress right now. Um, it, it definitely would not pass the Senate. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, however, if you remember, after the Great Depression and after World War II, the way that our economy got back to speed was the New Deal, was the FDR New Deal. Well, so, you know, it doesn't have to be called the Green New Deal. Whatever it is, pumping money into, you know, our future, which is renewable energy in, in many cases, certainly could help us to emerge much stronger uh, out of this economic recession or depression. Um, and there is definitely support across the board, even in Republican circles, although right now not necessarily from Republican lawmakers. It is an election year, so is likely not to be much progress. Right now in the House of Representatives, um, they, the Democrats there, are trying to pass something uh, that will help with renewable energy, I believe, in their $3 trillion package. But apparently that's not going to make it very far through the Senate. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us.